early in the pandemic, when vaccines were scarce, community health centers in North Carolina often had to contend with racially biased vaccine access issues. Rocky Mount OIC Health Center managed to mobilize its community to operate outside of local government entities and reach the people impacted the hardest, black and brown frontline essential worker communities. I'm Ben Money, NAC Senior Vice President for Public Health Priorities, and this is Health Centers on the Front Lines. In today's episode, we'll talk to Reuben Blackwell and Sherry Bryant of Rocky Mount OIC Health Center about how they are battling systemic racism in addition to the pandemic as they protect their communities from COVID-19. Reuben, can you tell me about Rocky Mount OIC Health Center and the community you serve? Certainly, Ben. Thank you so much for having us on today. We are privileged and excited to be able to join you in this podcast. OIC um, has been in in Rocky Mount for over 50 years. Uh, We were an education and training organization as part of a national affiliation uh, in about 40 communities across the United States. Rocky Mount um, has been here serving uh, marginalized populations and, and, uh, you know, fragile communities for all that time. In about 2012, we joined the movement um, as a Section 330. Three years prior to that, we were designated as a lookalike. And since that time, we've grown our practice from um, about you know 2,000 patients today to about 15,000 uh, or more and growing. We have three full-time primary care practices, a dental practice, um, the integrated behavioral health, imaging, mammograms, uh, as well as other types of imaging, uh, physical therapy or exercise therapy, rather, and pharmacies and all other kind of things that are happening that are targeted and focused primarily on the Black community in our community. Uh, we serve everyone, but our unashamed focus are on the people who need help the most. And in our community in the South, those populations are predominantly Black people who are living below the poverty level. Great. Thank you. And your health center also serves Rocky Mount, North Carolina, which has a historic split between two counties uh, and it's divided along racial lines. What are the legacies of your service area's racial past that surfaced during the pandemic? And how did your health center respond? Sure. Well, you know, when 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 we're talking um, all things South, and all things American, you cannot divorce our history from where we currently live and who we are today. Um, in Eastern North Carolina, um, this is the section of the state that is broad and flat and served by rivers. And that was the perfect environment for large plantations. So in North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, of which Rocky Mount is the first major city that enters into the coastal plains region, we are the place where slavery really existed in large percentage. We have economies that are built um, in banking, in agriculture, in industry around the devaluing of human life so that others can grow and prosper at our expense. So those things and, and that economy, that whole concept has created a, a, a platform of inequities and disparities that exist in every form of life today. So when health centers and and other health professionals start talking about social determinants of health, those things were not just created 30 and 40 years ago. They were created 400 years ago. And the thoughts and the concepts and the systems that have maintained and exacerbated those inequities just presented themselves in a different kind of way during COVID. Every single fragility that existed in major systems were exposed and and it increased exponentially Black people's exposure to COVID. So what we found, Ben, is that OIC had to take a very different approach from the public health policies that our state and even federal governments were coming down with. Uh, We were unwilling because we were witnessing people who were dying and being infected by droves um, in a small community like Rocky Mount that is divided along historical uh, racial lines, one county predominantly black, the other county predominantly white, one county predominantly agricultural and, uh, you know, fraught with all types of economic challenges. Another county that is prospering at a greater clip, a greater rate than the other, juxtaposed together and joined together by a railroad track. 
the stark realities were that people who were living in Edgecombe County were unable to sign up to get tested at the time, if you recall, because you had to do all that stuff through a very complicated system online. And when the vaccines rolled out, they were the last people who were able to get lined up for the shots. And in you recall, in your former job, we just sort of challenged the whole system and said, this does not work for black people. You know, you cannot look at population health management in, in normal terms when it concerns a pandemic. You cannot go by people's ages that are, you know, your natural age, because I might have an environmental age that eclipses what my my human years have accumulated. I might have predisposed conditions that have been handed to me, hereditary, and, and, and my food choices and my environment in which I'm living. I might be a 35-year-old person, but I might be uh, health-wise 30, 64 years old. Or 65 years old. So, you know, in my own personal experience, I just have to say that in, in a year from February 2020 to February 2021, I knew personally, personally, and I'm not talking about statistics, I knew 35 people who died from COVID. And the only thing they had in common is that they were black and they died from COVID. You know, so to me, those realities were exponentially enhanced because of COVID. And we, as a health center, had to respond to the challenges of keeping our patients alive, keeping our communities healthy, and even looking internally at our own systems about what we needed to do with education, about what we needed to do to equip our own healthcare workers with the information and the culture of self-protection while battling all of this political fallout around, can we trust the government in what they're saying related to health care as it relates to black people. And Ruben, you bring up the point that uh, during that period of time, I was Deputy Secretary for Health Services in North Carolina. And Edgecombe County and the disparities in Edgecombe County were not unknown to us. Edgecombe County had always shown up on the list of counties with the greatest health disparities and should have been the priority uh, for testing and for vaccination, particularly knowing that, um, the, uh, incidence of COVID was hitting those communities disproportionately. I think the system was built and, um, designed around a pandemic response that was really driven, uh, from the federal level to the state and then to county government entities, uh, to tackle. And, you know, one of the things that, that we saw was during this pandemic, during this crisis, those systems that we relied on from the federal government all the way down um, were not what we anticipated, anticipated them to be. Uh, and so OIC, recognizing that the uh, infrastructure that was designed to support the pandemic was failing communities of color, OIC stepped in, uh, and not only to... Um, tackle this issue, but also to raise the alarm. And I know you called me on several occasions and really pointed out specific instances where uh, the system was failing. Uh, you weren't alone in that. You had other partners uh, across your community that, that raised the alarm uh, to the highest levels, to the secretary and to the governor. Uh, but in the meantime, OIC stepped in. You formed partnerships with churches, community groups. You work directly uh, with us at DHHS to access testing and vaccines. Can you talk about the importance of the health center's ability to operate outside of the political forces uh, to reach people impacted the hardest, these frontline essential workers in black and brown communities? Sure. Well, for us, uh, Ben, it was pretty simple. You know, everything we do um, at a community health center centers around community. <laughs> you know, um, that, that's, that's the operative word in everything we do at OIC is what is good for the community. And, uh, we were, we were being called by, um, by pastors. We were being called by lay people. We were being reached out to by members of fraternities and sororities, other nonprofit organizations, other healthcare organizations, because we have a reputation for at OIC for being grounded in community and grounded in uh, creating strategies that perhaps 
uh, work around the restrictions that government has a tendency to have to operate within. And, and so uh, for us, our first step was really just talking to our partners and friends. And, and we created something together with um, a broad support of churches called Community Angels. And because at that time, um, the, the, the registration for uh, testing was all online, the registration for vaccines was all online. We live in communities that have uh, challenges with broadband. We have, uh, our patients have challenges with having devices challenges with people's work schedules, challenges with elders and seniors who were not internet savvy, even if they could get online. And so what we started doing together with our community were creating other systems that were friendlier to the way people lived every day. And instead of making people adapt to what the state of the federal government stated, we made the state and federal government adapt to what what our people needed. And thank God for someone like you sitting in a position that could advocate effectively because you helped us convert um, our efforts into real success. When other entities were having difficulty reaching out to people of color um, in the pandemic, we had near 100% um, penetration into our markets. You know, we were testing um, at, a, at a high rate, 94, 95% black people in places where they live. We took the testing from, from a central location and took it to where people actually were. We had mobile units that went out, you know, into communities. We worked in churches and, you know, and we, we've continued to do that. What we did in testing, we flipped over to vaccinations. And that's where Ben, you know, um, it was very helpful. Um, I, I have with me, uh, one of my, uh, key leaders in the executive team, Sherry Bryant, who um, joined us and who she worked with a major hospital system in North Carolina. And, and her responsibility, and I'll let her tell more about that, was around um, some of the same things that we were trying to do, but doing it for a larger system that had to comply with these, um, you know, edicts and, and with the approaches. I'm not saying anything was evil. It's just that when you're a government and you're working with large health systems, you have to do what benefits everyone. But people get lost in that what benefits everyone. And that's where FQHCs have flexibility. We're able to more rapidly adapt to the challenge. And then we're able, if you have motivated systems, we're able to connect with larger systems so that we can leverage their resources to the full benefit of our community, of our state, and of our nation. And, and, and maybe I don't, I don't know if I'm shifting a little bit, but I do think that we've got to see that our people do not live in these lines, uh, where it's very clear you go to the hospital for this, you go to the primary care for that, you go to the FQHC for the, you people live where they just have needs. And if a system understands that you exist to serve the needs of your people, then you do what must be done. That's what FQHCs and community health centers are excellent at. And that's where I think, Ben, the support that NAC, the support that our state our PCA association provided for us and the support that your leadership in the state of North Carolina made a difference and saved tens of thousands of lives, I'm convinced, just in our region and more across the entire state. Thank you. And Sherry, um, you joined OIC during this pandemic, just like I joined NAC uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. What have you learned since being with health centers that can help us uh, work better with hospitals to address health equities? The fact of the matter, um, Ben, is that collaborative relationships between hospitals and federally qualified health centers um, benefit both the providers um, as well as the patient. Um, you know, understanding that there's a scarcity in our resources and to effectively partner together to come back and being able to work through the avoidable ER visits and the decrease in um, the, the health of our communities. The, you know, being in a pandemic, um, you know, the disparities in healthcare didn't begin with COVID-19. 
Um, you know, they had been around. Um, COVID-19 just helped uh, put a spotlight on the mistrust of the community. And so having come from a larger health system into an SQHC OIC, um, that collaboration is absolutely important. Um, but the other thing that here now at, with an FQHC versus having been with a larger health system, FQHC, um, to Mr. Blackwell's point, community, they have it, um, down pat. They know the heart of their communities. That's not to say that the others do not, but as Mr. Blackwell stated, it was a little, you know, it was for everybody. Um, you know, when you come from a larger health system and having partnered with um, two major um, health systems in getting the, the testing and the vaccines deployed, um, seeing that, uh, you know, it's not just the, you know, oh, my doctor said I need to get this vaccine. Um, it really was more intentional conversations and education with everyone to help them understand that um and and quite frankly having someone that looks like them explain to them the importance of testing this is prior to the vaccine and then when the vaccine came out the importance of trusting science helping them understand that there was the proper amount of due diligence done and then going to their neighborhoods and appealing to them where they are um, it's not just having them come to you. It's us going to them. That help, in my opinion, um, forge that relationship between the community and the uh, health centers, which would be the providers that they should know and trust um, to be able to combat this pandemic. And then, more importantly, start those partnerships and collaborations with the hospital and health systems and FQHCs. To be able to, um, you know, do what FQHCs are known to do, which is be a patient-centered medical home. You know, we are at the inception of patient-centered medical home. And so that is what we do. Um, we know very well what our hospital systems do to be able to partner together to, to take care of our patients in those ways um, is exactly what, in my opinion, this pandemic has helped us with. Um, and I, you know, look forward to continuing those partnerships here in the East. Thank you, Sherry. And, you know, one of the things you point out is that a lot of the hesitancy wasn't so much around the vaccine, but who was actually administering the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So having a, a, you know, trusted provider in the community that has relationships really made a difference. And we saw that with the data. Um, one of the things that, that health centers did early on was really push for uh, DHHS to have data, particularly on vaccinations by race and ethnicity. Um, so North Carolina uh, opted to develop its own vaccine management system that would allow it to build race and ethnicity uh, reporting as a feature uh, as a reportable feature, as a mandatory requirement for vaccine submission. So that meant that any provider that was administering the vaccine had to report on race and ethnicity of each vaccine dose that they provided. It gave us very rich data uh, early on during the vaccine initiative, and it also allowed um, advocates for social justice to really point out uh, at the state level and then eventually at the county level, now down to the zip code level, uh, where disparities actually existed in vaccine administration. And Ruben, one of the things that you brought out um, was an example of how the initial um, uh, design of uh, vaccine access and a, was based on an appointment system, which was based on online scheduling. And that immediately created disparities, particularly recognizing that you got not only the digital divide, but you have internet access issues uh, within rural communities and particularly in black and brown communities. And not to mention low income individuals and elderly uh, have uh, limited access uh, to that level of technology. So one of the things that we saw and your advocates in Edgecombe County and other counties surrounding it pointed out so clearly to DHHS was that there were people in wealthier uh uh, more white uh, counties, uh, in, in some cases over 100 miles away, that were 
accessing appointment slots from uh, patients, actually, really taking those slots from people that needed them in the most impacted communities, getting those slots and then driving 100 miles to get the vaccine, basically pushing folks out of line to be able to get uh, a vaccine that they actually had access to within their own communities. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we saw was that without having that data, uh, we were never able to really point out the fact that the numbers just didn't add up, that you had communities that were black and brown, but yet when the vaccines were administered, they were predominantly white. Uh, so how did you also use that data to get resources in, in your community? Well, what we did um, was that we, uh, first of all, were very intentional. You know, um, we communicated to all of our partners that our concentration and our focus, because of the data that was coming back to us from the state and from our county, was that in, in Rocky Mount, and particularly in inner city communities in Rocky Mount, that there was a clear lack of uh, penetration of vaccines. So what we did not do, we were not the first out of the gate band. <clears throat> we took our time before we really got involved in the testing and the vaccination um, efforts to see exactly what trends were, what was working in other places and what was not working. We, we tried to be clear that we had to build a team that looked like the communities that we serve. And I really want to emphasize that people feel more comfortable dealing with people who are like themselves, no matter who they are, than anyone else. And so we built up a team of young interns that came from the communities that we were serving. We, we trained them in outreach techniques. We trained them in, uh, in, in information related to COVID. We created infrastructures where they could navigate very simply with their friends and with their family. We made sure that we had uh, professionals who could administer the vaccines. You know, you didn't have to have all uh, MDs or PAs or nurse practitioners, but you do have people who knew, who could give a good shot. <laughs> you know, you did have to have people who could be conversant in talking about um, both the disease, both from a testing end as, as well as a vaccination end. So we spent a lot of time helping people understand how to communicate uh, accurately the information around uh, the, the entire COVID dilemma. Because this is such a politicized event, um, there's so much myth around the disease, around the, um, the fallout around the disease, and, and particularly intentional disruption in Black communities about why not to get tested or why not to get the shots. And we spent a lot of time on marketing, a lot of time on social media, and a lot of time in talking with people one-on-one -on -one and in smaller settings so that we were able to enlarge and broaden our support base of community so that when we did create our systems to roll out, that people were ready and lined up. So we went away from this um, online registration to where people were being called. They were doors knocked on. You know, any way that we could get the word of mouth out, handing out flyers. And those things sound like archaic, you know, in a digital world, but they were effective in reaching our population. So much so that uh, we stopped having to seek out people to sign up. All we had to do is publish calendars and places where OIC would be. And we found that people lined up. People would tell their family members, their friends, their coworkers. And then the next thing you know, they're starting to ask us, will you come to my church? You know, can you work in my business? You know, can you help us uh, protect ourselves? So that's, that, that, that's, I think, an aspect that, that we had to shift away from while meeting the requirements and standards of the state and federal government. We never did anything. Um, that did not give you the information that you needed. But what we also did was challenge the thought of traditional public health about who was eligible and who deserved and who needed these vaccines. So, um, and I also want to thank, uh, you, Ben, for being very broad minded 
and very tough skinned. <laughs> you know, we've been friends for a minute, but um, the friendship did not save you. <laughs> I took my licks. <laughs> you, you gave me some wood on many occasions. <laughs> yeah, but I just want to thank you because not only did you take it, you heard it. You know, you heard us. And, and, and I'm really pleased. And when Sherry came on board, who is a systems expert, you know, um, she was able to bring a higher level of thinking and helping us to grow what we had done infrastructure wise to perfect it, to help move us. Because the other side is that if we want to continue to keep our communities healthy, We've got to help our community shift as well because the world does not stop because we have needs, you know. So now that's where we are, I think, you know, in flux as an organization of perfecting our own internal infrastructure, making sure that we have uh, the right capacity to be able to rightly serve our population and then involve our population on being retrained or rethinking how to have a better, more open mind about how to navigate in these tools that are given. So instead of just using Google to find out, you know, the name of my latest stars, whatever, <laughs> you know, or the latest news, how to let this this phone, this this telephone, you know, be a connector for good health, be a connector for, you know, a better way to preserve my life and my family's life and learn how to use information in an appropriate manner that's suitable for my own well-being as well as for just good information. Yeah, and I found that, that, that I found that patients were really, really amenable to that, wherein we took an opportunity where we were talking about testing or administering a vaccine, but to also bring it back around to preventative health and how this is important and how now, you know, you're getting back into the system. So now let's get us scheduled for you to come back in and let's have some regular appointments. And, you know, we have dental care and that, you know, dental hygiene is important. And, you know, so we, we so we're having the opportunity now to build um, the la long lasting relationships with our FQHC um, that started with a pandemic that started with a test and a vaccine that has now afforded us an opportunity to educate and bring it back full circle to preventative health care as well. Great. You know, Ruben, you've heard me say that uh, the end of the pandemic is really just the end of the beginning. That's that right. the law game is pandemic recovery. That's right. right. And we haven't even gotten COVID behind us yet. And one of the things that we saw during COVID was just how crucial addressing social drivers of health are, you know, food insecurity, housing, uh, transportation barriers. And as a health center that is also an affiliate of Operations Industrial Corporation, what are some of the unique services that you provide your patients and the community in general that are going to help them move past this pandemic? Right. Th thank you. Gotcha. So, you know, we've always understood at OIC that uh, thing, life is interconnected and, and related. And, and the main thing that we focus and concentrate on here at OIC is helping people identify challenges themselves and then us helping them figure out how to deal with it so that when a person uh, gets a stumbling block, which, which happens in everyone's life, not to be paralyzed by the block or diffused in such a way that you are not able to, to collect your strength and find ways to work around it or directly confront it and walk over it. So we provide a, an array of um, basic education services, skills training, trades training. Uh, we have an integrated training academy that works from everything from health occupations to advanced manufacturing to construction. Um, everything we do at OIC is related to how to increase a person's quality of life, whether that's through the obtaining of a better job, whether it's through opening up your own business or helping your business that you're already operating in perform more successfully, or whether that's just having um, a more enlightened perspective about what you need to do, like movement. That's why we we, we did an excess. We took a, a, a chance, Ben, 
and started something called exercise therapy, you know, which um, is not like physical therapy, but really it's, it's having a, a method of movement for people understanding why is exercise important. We don't ask them to pay for anything. You know, we ask them, you know, if you fit a certain demographic, you know, if you, if your A1C is off the charts, if you've gained a lot of weight, you know, if you have other chronic illnesses that are um, a result of your physical health status, then we find ways to help you prioritize movement and we'll help you do it. And we'll help you find access to better food. We work with Black Farmers Network here. And we provide uh, food uh, food baskets or, 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 or bags or whatever it takes, you know, on a regular basis so that people, if they cannot eat or don't have the money to do it, we find ways to get uh, funding for them. Uh, we provide um, opportunities for public housing. Uh, we collaborate intently uh, in, in an intentional manner with our public housing authority. Uh, we work hand in hand. We have a team. Uh, that Sherry leads that is working with our housing authority. And during COVID, Ben, uh, we had one of the few, if not only partnerships in the country where we actually had a team going door to door in public housing communities and, and, and finding out, you know, if they knew how to keep themselves safe in their household, making sure that the households were tested in outbreak areas where seniors were living in. And, and communicating and collaborating together. If there were no masks, we, we got a chance to get masks out to them. You know, we, we're, we're inoculating people door to door. You know, that's something that you don't find everywhere, but it's because of our love of community that we do these things. We're working with um, some veterans now in looking at um, how to build tiny homes for um, veterans who have mental health challenges, who find themselves without employment, and who have been homeless. And now because of OIC working in collaboration with our partners, we're trying to find ways to help them uh, find their own dignity and have a safe, sound place to live, to take them out of the elements so that they can begin, you know, enjoying their own life. And because the service they provided to our nation and our country, they deserve to be treated um, as privileged individuals who are respected and appreciated by our community. So we find any way that we can, Ben, to fill a gap wherever there's a need, and we'll continue to do that. Ruben, you, you point out the fact that health centers, to be effective in serving their community, really need to work outside of the four walls of their clinic, uh, and they need to do it in partnership. They can't be unilateral organizations. So, you know, one of the things that we know in response to, to COVID and the inequities that were uh, so dramatically highlighted, almost every agency, public and private now, has made, you know, quote unquote, an equity statement. How do you sort through the stated intentions of organizations to identify who are going to be your long term partners? Well, you know, the whole point of equity is to create an outcome that you do not have. And um, I sort of find it um, disingenuous to have a lot of conversation around equity and diversity, and you haven't done the work inside your own house, you know, <laughs> um, before you can even begin to have a conversation about what you're going to help another entity do to create more equitable outcomes, you got to first look at who is designing what the outcome is, is intended to be. So if you're an organization that serves a predominantly black population and all of your executives are white, then you got a problem in your own organization. You can't hire a black equity officer to go fix the problem. The problem is you, <laughs> you know, and so, so you got to, you know, and, and people really have to understand that these are not nice little things for the moment. We're talking about trying to equip our country in order to be more competitive globally and taking advantage of all this resource of humanity that the United States is a melting pot of. You know, we cannot move away from what has happened nor from the future that we're about to walk into. And so, Ben, the first thing I look at, just as Sherry stated, 
you know, a little earlier, you know, people receive the message better when they hear it from someone who has some shared commonality of life experience, you know. And so when we're looking at equity designs, you know, we have to make sure that we're building equity from the top to the side to the bottom, because that's how the world operates, you know. And if we want to change the outcome, then we've got to make space room for all perspectives and we've got to find a way to say that a person's lived experience is valued and valuable, even if it's different from mine. You know, so one of the things that, that we're trying to do here is help people, first of all, determine what is good for you. It's one thing for me to say, I think Ben should, you know, have a gray suit. Well, if Ben doesn't like gray suits, <laughs> <laughs> if gray suits don't do anything for you, then what is it for me to tell you what kind of suit you need? So when we start planning, we think about what does our community need? What do they want? What does quality of life mean for them? And then we start designing backwards from there, not assuming that everybody wants what we think is good for them. That's that's the beginning point. Sherry, you have anything you want to add to that or No, I think you you hit the nail right on the head um is, you know, what does that mean? And and that's really generally what we start with when we talk about success and when we talk about, you know, health, we know what health means. Um but success to one may not be success to the other. Success to them may be, you know, what I ate a salad today and not a cheeseburger. And, you know, and, and that's where we begin is to help educate them on let's make proper food choices. How do we make proper food choices? And, um, you know, not to talk to them and put them in a box with what we think it should be, but this is collaborative health, um, in order for us to maintain, um, between the walls. And, and as you stated, um, Ben, you know, the most important thing is, um, what happens after they leave us? is really what where the care is. It, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's fine when they're in the four walls of a hospital because they had some type of acute event to happen. Um, and then they come for their follow-up visit and they're working with us. Um, but OIC stands for much more than just that. It is, yes, we're going to take care of you when you need us. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be well, but we want you to be whole. And that's what the other side of OIC um, helps with is, and that's kind of our mission and our motto, helping people help themselves. What does that mean? You know, we have repeated, um, you know, stories of, of people out in the housing authority where we've had those discussions with them. And, you know, what success meant to them is to take one of our classes, um, you know, to get their GED, to be able to take care of themselves, which then kind of helps with everything else. And so, um, you know, as we start to look at those partners, um, you know, for equity, uh, absolutely echo what Mr. Blackwell said, look in, internally to yourselves first. Um, and then, you know, what I'm looking for is longevity in it. I'm not looking for this has been the hot topic right now. Um, you know, everybody is on this bandwagon and, um, you know, I want to see what's going to happen. As you stated, um, being we're, we're not even out of the pandemic yet. Let's still have the same conversation, the same passion, um, the same collaborative spirit after the pandemic. Is it, that's that's going to be important? And then one thing we know, Ben, that there's going to be a next something, <laughs> you know. And if we have not learned the lesson now that all human lives matter, and and if we have not done our work, and we have not as a nation. Um, to ensure that every life is valued, then we will have more conversations like this, more challenges like this, and you never know what the outcome will be and whose doorstep it will land if we have not done our job. And, and Sherry and Ruben, one of the things that you all have done so effectively is really advocate for your communities and for the needs of the patients that you serve. What is your health center doing to, to continue that mobilization around advocacy for that unknown that we're anticipating? 
Okay, yeah, we're sure. building. Yeah, we're building infrastructure so such that we we have learned um, very quickly with what this pandemic. We all, not just SQHCs and OIC, but everyone had to move very very quickly to try to get a handle on what was this thing called COVID nineteen and how can we be safe. Um, you know, and so what we have now is the infrastructure of, of people that, um, you know, each and every day, what we wake up and what we think about is, you know, outreach, number one. And then number two is how can we preserve what we have now built? We've always been out in the community. We've always had some of the partnerships that we've had, but we want to be able to mobilize and ramp up much quicker, which much more quicker. So to, to Mr. Blackwell's point about how we knew that we were having to, to do the, um, you know, phone call, phone banks and knocking on doors, we're going to continue to do that. We're just going to continue to do it with, you know, preventative health care being at the forefront so that whenever that next thing comes, we're not going to be scraping and scrounging, trying to find people. You know, this is something that um, is near and dear to our heart. We've always had a mobile unit. Um, we are, you know, going to be having a second one come on board um, actually this week. Um, and so those mobile units um, will be focusing on primary care. And so we will be out into the homeless shelters and we'll be out into the housing authorities. So we will maintain the infrastructure to still be able to um, assist the community. Um, and whenever that next thing happens, um, we have all the infrastructure now in place so that we can move rapidly. And, and then the other side of that too, is that, you know, we've got to help our communities understand that policy is created through elected government and communities that do not show up at the ballot are not at the primary consideration of any elected official. So we are unashamed <laughs> about uh, asking our patients to register to vote. We are very clear on helping people understand what issues are related to their own well-being. We don't endorse political parties or candidates, but we do endorse policy. And we help people understand what policy matters are. So when it concerns Medicaid expansion in North Carolina, when it concerns um, the right to be able to make decisions about who your providers are and the types of, of, of uh, pharmaceuticals you can access and the cost of, of pharmaceuticals, then those things are things that we communicate to our patients and to our community. And then you also know that we have a reputation of keeping elected officials accountable for their decisions. So you cannot divorce accountability from advocacy, you know, and, and we've got to help our communities understand that the most important election is every election. <laughs> you know, there is no such thing as this election is not important, but the right. next one is every election is important. Right. And the one thing that I like to challenge my community health center peers across this country is that if you think sitting back and not participating actively in advocating with every party, you know, Democrat, Republican, Green Party, whoever, for the position of the people that we serve across this nation, then you cut your own throat. <laughs> you know, and we've seen that NAC has been a strong partner for us at the national and the federal level. Well, we need that same level of strength in every state, in every government, local, state, and federal. So I'm hoping that um, that this this move towards advocacy is embraced by CEOs and by staff members all across the country to advocate for your people. We exist because of the people that we serve, and to not use our privilege and our opportunity to speak for the people who need us the most, I feel is an abrogation of that trust that people have in us. If they trust us enough to come to us every month or every whatever they come and share with us their most vulnerable concerns and issues and trust us 
to treat them and care for them, then they should be able to trust us to advocate on their behalf when they need us to. Ruben, you're right. It is a sacred obligation that we have, um, and we need to honor that by raising our voice and not letting our exhaustion, our fatigue, uh, uh, keep our volume down. Now's the time to turn the volume up. That's right. I want to I want to close out with this final question, and, and really just to see how you all are doing. You know, I'm sure that everyone on your team has been personally impacted by COVID. Uh, I was actually at a health center conference uh, recently where a medical director shared that they're practicing trauma-informed care for their staff. So what are you doing to support your team in healing? Well, what I'm going to say, uh, Ben, straight up, is that, you know, this required, and, and think about it, we started being aware of covid uh, February 2020. I mean, there were the noise and the sound was out, you know, the, the December, you know, November, December 2019, but it really started heating up, you know, February 2020. And in March, it just hit everybody like a ton of bricks. And, and what we immediately started uh, doing is trying to check in to make sure we were all okay. And, and so uh, the first things that we have to always do is sort of like looking, you know, on the airplane, you know, they always tell you, you know, that's right. You know, put the mask on yourself, you know, and then take care of your neighbor. Well, for us, you know, we were really taking care of our neighbors, our friends and our families, and we weren't doing enough to take care of ourselves. And so while we were authorizing overtime and we were trying to be more flexible, you know, working with people's environments, we still learned that we were taxing people, you know, to the point of exhaustion, you know. And, and so we uh, really embraced this uh, flexible workplace environment as long as we could uh, because we recognized that people were being challenged. And, and I'm so thankful that Sherry is here because COVID stretched me to the end of my um, creativity. <laughs> and I just have to say the Lord sent somebody <laughs> to help us uh, work more proficiently with, with advocating for our own people's needs. So, um, you know, having the right people on staff, doing the right things making sure that we had a flexible approach to uh, PTO or paid time off, uh, making sure we had scheduling sensitivities, you know, um, and, and backing each other up, um, having a more flexible approach to how to support our customers, you know, was really, really important. And then uh, we really... Um, stretched ourselves and we spent a lot of the money that was, uh, focused, you know, sent to us because of COVID on, on training new personnel. So we had a really broad and large intern program and some of those interns are now becoming full-time OIC professionals. They go cross train, you know, in, in different aspects of the operation and organization. And um, Sherry is putting in place a phenomenal effort, I think, to really support the re-education of our team members about how to approach the workplace in a more balanced and a more healthy um, uh, uh, way so that they are not falling prey to that exhaustion, you know, and not falling prey to uh PTSD, you know, <laughs> which absolutely, and you know, encouraging the use of our EAP services, yes. um, you know, being more mindful, um, you know, understanding your boundaries personally and professionally. Um, you know, one thing that I can say that COVID had taught me was how to say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I think that that it, that surrounds around, um, you know, uh, a, a large portion of it professionally is accountability, taking responsibility, um, you know, showing up for each other, understanding that the hardship that we all feel when one person doesn't do what they were supposed to do. 
Um, and that, you know, it's, it's important for us to take care of ourselves. And the way that we do that is by working and doing the things that we know are the right things to do, um, to help one another. But most importantly, to know when, uh, it's time to fold and when you can't, um, do anymore. And that's okay. Um, and, you know, a lot of times that, um, you know, we, I think all of us have had some opportunities to, to, to read some books and listen to some podcasts and do some, you know, self reflection. Um, and so I've also started with, um, you know, different training programs that are allowing them to also take some time to, to do those things as well, um, for their, um, personal, um, growth and mental health. And, and also with the exercise therapy piece, you know, we've yes. made exercise therapy available to every employee at OIC. So we have our group exercise times. Uh, we have some stretch times and uh, some massage therapy times for our team. And on some of those testing events that uh, we hold, we actually uh, bring in our exercise therapist and massage therapist, and uh, we help our staff, you know, when they've been working long hours, they can go take a little break and, you know, get some aromatherapy and, and get some stretching and a little massage here to just say, hey, you need a little pick-me-up, we can help you in that manner too. So, you know, I think um, what COVID has taught us is how to be, um, as Sherry stated, a more mindful employer, you know, and, and, and try to look at what will it take for you to maintain your mental health while you're providing a very important and needful service to the community that we serve? We really do know that our organization and community health centers are lifesavers to communities. And I'm sure if anybody who works in healthcare has a story about what their team has done to save someone's life. Well, that's a wonderful thing, and it's a stress-filled environment. So, you know, I think that um, the the task of helping people recognize and appreciate each other while you're doing the hard work is important, and also finding ways to cope with the accumulation of all that stress is important too. And um, and I'm one that I'm the first one lined up that needs the help. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, you know, thanks for calling it to our attention again. Um, but I just say to all of our peers, let's, let's take care of ourselves. You know, while we're saving the world, we got to take care of ourselves too. You're absolutely right. And you're, you know, what you've demonstrated today on our, in our discussion is really just the critical role that health centers have played in the pandemic and we know are going to be playing in pandemic recovery long into the future. Uh, thank you for taking care of your community. Thank you for taking care of your staff. And thank you for taking care of yourselves. And please continue to do so. Again, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, just keep up the good work.